So imagine a world. As a poet, I thought I'd take this literally and fantastically. So this is literally three postcards from the pandemic, the before postcard. We are amongst unbridled fires, lush landscapes blistering. We are reading about injustice, donating on our way to work, our faces pressed against the window. During the pandemic, we are in partial lockdown, house to house, screen to screen, so many hours inside our heads, so much kindness, and yet we crumble into ourselves, doubt all our simple decisions. We mourn family and feasts and festivity, begin to imagine a new elongated parable. We are in slow motion at the dinner table. We look lovingly at the spoon. We communicate in chat room smiles, but dissolve into bundles when we leave. We send packages to those we love, but can't open the toothpaste without weeping. We feel as if we're in a snow dome, trinkets unmoored behind glass. Writing just to release our introspection, curling up in blankets just for warmth. Gaps highlighted in wealth, status, age, race, sex and disability. We have marched forcefully with thunder, but carefully. So much kindness and yet so many hours inside our heads, house to house, screen to screen, we are in personal lockdown. And the third postcard from the pandemic, after. We are sitting in the park with blankets. We are giving the earth an electrocardiogram. We are decreasing zoonotic and vector-borne diseases. We are increasing all habitable regions. We are measuring the rise of biodiversity. We are dismantling any outmoded structures. We are carving out a new equilibrium. We are cultivating and ripening our values. We are luxuriating in ongoing learning. We are bathing in the shadow of the cosmos. We are listening to our elders we are communicating with our scientists. We are immersed in our hunt for discovery. We accept our shortcomings, but demand more. We are vigorous in our change. We are moving. Wish we were here. Sincerely, Earth. Okay. Thank you. So let's hear from some amazing speakers. So nothing can fill us so completely with wonder as the night sky. Its beauty, its vastness, and its apparent unchanging presence. Not just on human timescales of millennia, but on timescales of billions of years. But even our local galaxy can be punctuated by the occasional explosion. And we call that a supernova. And if you watch very carefully here, you'll see the bright star at the bottom of the screen explode just as a supernova would, spreading the elements that have been forged in the core of the star right through the galaxy. And it's a very human image in the end. I was remarking earlier, it ends up looking a little bit like the iris of an eye um, at the end. So what do we learn? The universe will proceed on its course with or without us. And the natural forces are much more powerful than anything we can ever conjure up. Ultimately, we're ruled by nature, be it a supernova or COVID-19. And we are creatures of our universe, from the atoms of our body to our entire fragile ecosystem. Our existence is completely intertwined with the very atoms that make up the universe. Events such as COVID or the 2019-20 bushfires are not really under our control. They are an integral part of the environment, but we can affect our interactions with our environment as it unfolds. We are responsible for our future in the universe. Rachel, how has this affected you personally? Someone who looks to the, to the macro, looks outside of the, universe, outside of the universe. How has it affected your time, your work? So, so it's a very interesting question. I mean, 
probably like everyone else, I've felt the world that I live in shrink in many, many ways physically, you know, to be quite constrained. But it's those images of what is actually out there that sort of lift you out of the house, you know, my bedroom, <laughs> whatever, to think about, you know, what really is out there and how we interact with it. And I think, I think for me, um, and I would sincerely hope that we realize how fragile our environment is and which in my mind takes us right to the issues of climate change. So, and I'll leave others to think about that. Seeing this group got together originally to discuss the Earthrise image, looking at the animation of the supernova event, if that were to happen in the night sky, um, you know, with no warning, yet everyone's got um, phones and so on to, to capture videos, perhaps that, you know, leads to being another um, Earthrise type image, but in the form of a video that really, again, puts us in our place in the universe. Do you want to maybe reflect on that in, in light of your comments that um, the universe goes on regardless? I mean, everybody will have their mobile camera out and be looking at it. And, and it, I, I think it will have a, an enormous impact on, on, on everybody on, on the planet, actually, because everybody will see it. You know, it, 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 typically in its bright phase, it, you know, it might last a month or two, you know, so, so, so it, there's a rise and then a, then a fall. Um, so so it, it will be easily, easily visible, easily visible. Um, and yes, it will be, I th well, it depends how people understand it, how defining it will be, I think. Uh, so it should, be, it should be very defining, but it depends on the messaging. And so seeing something like that in the night sky, it would be tiny and millions of years away. When a supernova goes off near to us, and it's overdue, um, so um, we expect them about every 400 years, and there hasn't been one for about 1,000 years. But when it goes off in the night sky, as it may do any day now, it'll be brighter than the moon. And will we get warning so we can all go and watch no, it? We won't, we'll get zero warning. We'll get zero warning, but we'll see it during the day. But it's a, effectively a random event. So it's, it's kind of like, I mean, these, these images, like you say, they, they do have such great impact, but I think it's also, um, you know, particularly in these circumstances that we find ourselves in, it is quite easy for people to catastrophize. Um, how do you sort of stop people from letting their imaginations go too down that path? It's a really interesting question. And I think probably what has happened is that we've, we've lost the capacity to put ourselves in, into a, a big picture, if you like, of humanity and the planet. And, you, you know, it's hard to say to your seven-year-old niece, you, you know, you were born, you will live a good life, you will die. And there is no escaping that reality. But what you want to think is that, that your time on the planet, you will, you will not leave it in a worse way um, state than than when you came in, and 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 I think I think that that sort of that sort of message is something that we've completely lost, you know, in our in our modern narrative um, of you know of how we live a life. Actually, it's making me philosophically and metaphysically explode here. <laughs> <laughs> Supernova. Supernova. That's right. Thanks, Rachel. Postcards mark a moment in time and a kind of special relationship. The postcard, this relationship is, you're close enough for me to share something important, but actually not close enough for me to write a whole letter. And so I grabbed a postcard and I threw a few words on it. And when you receive it, the, that relationship is reciprocated. You don't feel done down because you didn't get a long letter. You have this little spark of joy that somebody who was doing something amazing stopped for a moment and thought of you. And you take those and you stick them up on your, your cork board to, to just signal to everyone that someone liked me enough while they were in London to send me a picture. And during this global moment that we're all in, and we're all in different global moments, we're in one big moment, but we're having very different experiences. 
We've learned to connect with new technologies, but we've also reverted to some of the old, slower technologies. And what would those postcards say if we started to send them? For me, my contribution is going to ask the question, what postcards would animals send us if they had the choice? Now, the first one is one where if we pause through coronavirus and the lockdown, we vacated space that we usually occupy fully as humans. We moved back into our houses and we vacated area behind us. If you were fortunate enough to go to a natural area or a park in the middle of the early weeks of the lockdown and stand there, the quiet was deafening. There were no human noises, no cars, no planes, no boats, no screaming, nothing. And that quiet took over our land, our skies, our seas. We just stopped for a moment. And the next thing that happened is that space was filled with birdsong. I don't know how they got the memo, but they were all out there, making as much noise as they possibly could. Animals ventured out in a kind of joyous melody. They were screaming and tweeting and chirping wherever they could. They came out tentatively at first, not truly believing for a moment that humans were gone, and then almost bravely. Foxes out during the daytime in Royal Park. The penguins in St Kilda decided that they didn't need to stay on the rocks anymore, that if there weren't humans on the boardwalks, they could just as easily use the boardwalks. Our butterflies decided they didn't need to fly quite as high as they usually do because there was no people down low, and they took over all the space that we had vacated. Some animals have missed us. Animals like rats and seagulls, animals that really need us in order to survive. There's reports of rats leaving the city because there's no food when all the restaurants shut up. They've gone out to the suburbs. And the seagulls left the zoo when there were no more kids with meals to be stolen. I hope they get the message and come back when the people do. Actually, they did. <laughs> as humans, we're growing in number. And as we push out with our machines, with our farms, with our animals, we push animals back. And as we push them back, we leave less and less space for them. We touch every part of the globe and we push the animals out of our way. They just can't compete with our numbers, our machines and our relentless destruction. For a couple of months, we got to see how the world might be if we didn't push out, if we retreated back and left space behind for animals. As we retreated, they emerged. Imagine a world we left enough space for animals, a world where we were quiet enough to hear. And what we would hear might not make us happy. We would hear stories that might make us quite sad. We would hear stories of animals killed for no good reason because someone thought their horn might be useful for medicinal purposes, or their homes, or their flesh. Their homes are destroyed for profit, the wine of chainsaws, and the stench of palm oil fills our skies instead of their forests. We might also hear about the brave people who protect them, like the rangers who look after these rhinos 24 hours a day. The people who stand for animals, who protect them day in and day out. And in a time of crisis, there's a huge risk that the good people are forgotten and lost in the noise and the selfishness. Many animals rely on humans for their protection, on the small patches of land we leave behind for them. These animals need us for their futures and the future of their offspring. In far too many countries, conservation is left to charity or tourism. It's not even properly funded by governments to look after their own environments. And when the world stopped and went into lockdown, the tourism dollars stopped, dead. And no money is funding the rangers to protect the rhinos and no eyes are watching to see what happens when poachers emerge or when habitat is destroyed. These animals would wish we were here. But the last postcard, and the one that you should keep on your cork board the longest, is the picture of this cute little guy. That's a pangolin, and it comes from the beginning, a reminder that an animal virus can jump species and can change the course of history. These guys are really rare, 
They're a scaly anteater. Trade in them is banned around the world. Yet, the scales have been seen as medicinal and the flesh is eaten. While bats are considered the origin, we know that viruses from bats pass through other animals on their way into humans. And we're not quite sure how that happened with this one. But it could have been a pig or a civet or a pangolin. If they sent us a postcard, I think the message from the pangolin would be simple. It would surely say, please stop eating us. We're not things to be hunted and killed. We care about our lives and our youngsters. We have friends, we experience joy. We can be optimists and we can be pessimists. We think and we feel. To continue to push back animals, to think of them to things, to kill them needlessly and without thought is increasingly dangerous for them and for us. So let's pin up this postcard and let's change the way that we think about animals. Thank you. So good. Um, is there any animal that you noticed didn't cope with the noise? We think of the animals perhaps loving the quiet and the peace and the humans away, but were there any that perhaps really craved a bit of human? Definitely we noticed animals that didn't cope with the quiet, which I think is the question you're asking. It depends what you're used to. We noticed that a lot of smaller animals were hypervigilant. So they went into very, something's wrong, the background noise is gone, and now you can hear everything. Um, we saw when the seagulls left, um, some little hawks moved in, a uh, goshawk moved into the zoo. Now, if you're a meerkat, you don't like goshawks. So that wasn't necessarily a good thing. Um, without people around, the whole use of space changed, and that can be quite confronting if you're a prey species. So yes, some animals, that they minded that. Um, some missed the interaction. So we've been doing quite a bit of research into how our animals in the zoo, it's a perfect um, experiment because people would always ask, what is the impact of visitors on the animals in a zoo? But how would you ever know? Then we set up a perfect control experiment. We took all the people out and we watched what happened. So we've been watching that. We've done quite a lot of research into that. I haven't got the results yet, but we're going to have a look. And in particular, we were looking at species people might not think about. So butterflies, um, reptiles, some of the big cats, the great apes. We've watched all of them. Thanks, Jenny. That was great. Um, we had the devastating bushfires of 2019-20, and there was a lot of animal lives lost with that. And then we went into COVID. So has that helped or hindered some of that recovery? It's rained a lot. And, and that's really helped. So, and, and that's a, a third event that has happened. So we've had tremendous rain right across the, the fire scar. And so for many plant species, that should be a real blessing. And we would expect that we're going to see some, some early recovery. Not great for where ash is washed into rivers, and so there's been extraction of fish species, particularly um, Arthur Riley Institute has done an extraction of a lot of, of the Galaxus fish. Um, in terms of getting out and doing surveys post fires, it's been almost impossible. So we've missed out on some of that science, but I'm now seeing that start to happen. Um, and so we're starting to see some of those corrective actions taking place now. Um, a lot of the desktop studies carried on, a lot of the grant making carried on. So We've still seen some of the early steps progressing, but now that the world's slowly coming back online, I think we're gonna see a lot more activity. Jenny, I was interested in your comments, particularly about the pangolin, but you know, we've, we're learning that there needs to be space for the animals to live in, a, in a, their natural habitat. Have we really come to grips with how much of the planet we have to give back, if you like, to them in order to really have a healthy ecosystem? So there's a movement at the moment asking for 30% by 2030. Um, and, and not just, you see, the trick is not just the mountains and the ice caps and the deserts. It has to still be lush, productive land. It has to be rainforests. Um, so there is a call on for that. You know, it, I think that's better than what we've got now. But, you know, what is the right number? I mean, it was interesting to see how little space we really need and how little resources 
I mean, we've all found that we can actually get by on a whole lot less than we usually do. Um, and yet, perhaps we can start to stay like that. One thing that the COVID crisis has shown us is how quickly um, we can change our behaviour and even the way we think about things when in a, faced with the necessity to do so. And when you were talking about this and the use of animal products for medicine, I got, guess I had my hat on saying, oh, isn't that dreadful? But then, you know, like, why, why would you ever use these animal products for medicine? That's just ridiculous. But then I'm thinking, well, I'm actually a meat eater. So I think some of the way that you... Um, phrase that, it did really make me think about that aspect of our lives and the fact that now we do have some wonderful alternatives to eating meat. Would you like to comment about that? <laughs> I don't eat meat um, and I haven't for a long time. We don't need to eat meat. It, it's when you ask about how much space we need when we decide that we need to eat meat that vastly expands the amount of space we need as humans. We, we were learning that there's different ways of living. And I think you're right. That's what we need to keep exploring and find gentler ways of living. Um, while there were the odd story of people not being nice, overwhelmingly, we were seen to be compassionate and kind. We were nice to our neighbors. We still step back and let others pass if they need to. We're good people. People don't need to be greedy and um, wasteful. We can be much better. We just need to remember that. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I was really intrigued by the the change in the animal behaviour when we all went away. Are there lessons to be learned in, in how they're now adapting to us being back and sort of sustained behaviours that we as people are hoping to, that will we'll stay as we go forward? Yeah, it's interesting. Some of them that, you know, two months is about how long we take to build a habit. Um, and so some of them we're not seeing change their habits back quite as quickly because we all went sort of cold turkey. But some of the other animals that have just got used to people not being there, they're behaving as if we still weren't there. But remember, we're starting very gently. Animals are adaptable. They like us. They, they're watching us. They know what we're up to. And so they sort of move in and out. But yeah, our behaviors will change. So do you feel like that means there's a limited amount of time for us to seize on this, I guess, to, to keep these behaviors changed? I don't think so. I'm always hopeful about people. I'm a shocking optimist. We've seen what it's like to do things differently. You know, if you are going to only be at a conference for a day, do you really have to go around the world to do that? If you're on meetings all day, can we all just do those from our homes for a change instead of commuting? Um, and I would love to think that we'll learn from this and we'll find different ways of interacting and different ways of being and, and keep that being nice. Keep that top of mind. We've been really super nice to the vulnerable and the elderly. Um, how do we keep doing that? So I would like to think that it's not time bound. There's going to be able to reflect back on this moment over and over um, and, and then take what we can and learn from it. Okay, first I'd, I'd like to thank Kate Phillips for the overall concept of this talk, which is based on the idea of I can't breathe. Okay, so actually, before I get to the first postcard, I'd like to give you a small prologue. There's three points to my prologue. Number one, on July 17 in 2014, black American Eric Garner uttered the words, I can't breathe, 11 times whilst a New York police officer held him in a chokehold until he died. Number two, Images have a way of encapsulating and reflecting ideas, but also of starting them up, fueling the flame of ideological fires that may have been burning for some time. And number three, at the beginning of the pandemic, we didn't know quite what we were seeing. The 24 hour news fed us footage of communities in China, boarding up their perimeters, boarding up their homes and villages, locking themselves in and strangers out. As the death toll rose, the disturbing images began to make more sense. So, postcard one. Images can help us question the value of our civil liberties in the face of a pandemic. Here in Australia, the trauma of an unprecedented bushfire season was still very raw. The smoke still choking us. So perhaps we could be forgiven for being incredulous when told that we could no longer go to the beach. Beach closed, said the signs, a phrase that grated hard against our sense of freedom in a country that prides itself 
on sun, surf and sand and unlimited access to all three at all times. Images of police patrolling beaches, asking people to leave amidst the new confusion of social distancing measures, brought words like draconian back into common usage, but it was for our own good. So we reluctantly complied. I can't breathe. Postcard two, images can help us question our ethics. Are we doing the right thing by others? Random text from a friend. Toilet paper is running out. You got some, you okay? I've got 25 packets if you need some and baked beans and instant noodles and lots of flour because I think I'll take up baking when I'm trapped inside. Mm -hmm. If it gets to that, which it will, everyone's going to get it. Did you hear? Even Norman Swan, the doctor on the ABC has got it. I should get some more pasta. This is how the conversations went. I imagined people in their living rooms, Netflix on, surrounded by walls of toilet paper and canned food, waiting for the apocalypse. And while we waited for the virus to kill us, we lost our way in the supermarket. People fought over rolls of toilet paper like they were gold, losing their sense of dignity, of rationality, civility and kindness, and finding a long forgotten base form of humanness the selfish drive to survive despite all others, even at the cost of others. I can't breathe. And postcard three, images can help us bring about action to look for a better future. As Australia flattened the curve and New Zealand abolished it, the COVID-19 death toll in the United States soared past 100,000 with millions infected. In a country where the president blithely contradicts scientific advice and the facade of equality rubs thin, lockdown and social distancing are more difficult to enforce. The virus may be indiscriminate in who it infects, but the black population of the US are the poorest and most vulnerable and almost three times more likely to die from COVID-19 than white people. In Australia, we worked quite quickly to protect our First Nations remote communities who already suffer the poorest health in the country. But it must be recognised that health in Indigenous and Black communities is an ongoing racial issue. And COVID is just the latest in a string of diseases to wreak havoc on these minority populations. Likewise, Police treatment of black populations in both the US and Australia has a long and traumatic history. Here, that history is often kept out of sight, out of mind, with two to 3% of the nation's population being politically easy to ignore, even after three royal commissions into Aboriginal deaths in custody. But in Minneapolis, when George Floyd was held down by police pleading that he could not breathe, America and the world exploded in anger. Somehow, the tension of the COVID-19 lockdown, of social distancing, of sanitizing our hands, no matter what the color, somehow this hideous respiratory disease made us realize that we're all only skin, bone, sweat, and blood, that we rely on our neighbors when the chips are down, that we can commit to caring, that we can change or the better. I can't breathe. But imagine a world where we can, where we can balance our civil liberties with law, where we can act ethically towards others, and where we can act in the face of inequality and bring a sense of balance to the world. It's me, I'm, I'm just wiped some tears. <laughs> it's so, such a powerful thing. The, oh, this image is amazing. I yeah. love this image. In your look at pictures and, and your study of pictures, is it sometimes the most controversial photos, the most um, outstanding photos or quiet moments that you notice really hit people? Or is it a combination of all those things? What I mean, you can't say what brings change, but what really hits people in the guts? I think it's the circumstances that make something. 
So even with this task of picking just three images, for example, I mean, we've been swamped with pictures, you know, constant news feed, yeah? So to pick one particular image out of that huge mess of pictures was really tricky. But see, like, there are interesting things like that um, supermarket one, right? I mean, we're questioning the ethics or the behaviour of these people in the supermarket, but in fact, the way in which this image was made is questionable as well, you know? Someone's taken footage of these poor people in the supermarket, put it on Twitter, and it went around the world. It hit the newspapers around the world. Did they deserve that? So sometimes the way in which we make images can be just as complicated as the way in which they express ideas as well. They kind of feed each other in this kind of circular notion. I must say, picking up the I Can't Breathe, which of course has a very immediate um, you know, image at the moment, but it actually reflects back to um, you know, the bushfires, for example, when we um, really, our area was pretty shocking. Um, and also, as we move forward, you know, what we actually do to the planet. Um, I mean, being able to breathe is a, a really quite fundamental thing that we need to be able to do. And it's not really entered our consciousness. I think that we are actually quite capable of destroying um, the lungs of the earth, um, you know, as we move forward. So it's a, it's a very interesting, um, it's a very interesting phrase to, to, to hang on to. I found it so disappointing already to hear the traffic at peak hour in the morning and peak hour of an evening when there was that beautiful, blissful quiet for a while that Jenny was talking about. And now it's back again. And you do notice the difference in the air, you know? And so, yes, we, we're pretty much destroying the thing that we require to survive. Do you, do you think um, there was an image that, that helped people understand the, the science of needing to act quickly in terms of the pandemic and go into lockdown? I, I think a lot of people originally acted out of fear because there was a lack of understanding of what this disease was, where it came from. Um, and we were getting those initial feeds out of China, which were really disturbing to see villages basically blockading themselves, or the government even sealing people in. Um, and that was frightening. I think mm -hmm. that triggered something in people. And then there came this sort of wave of information that I think um, in Australia we were responsibly trying to, to feed to people, yeah? So I think there was a lot of scientific information out there that may not have been actually in photographic images like this. But then also, on the other hand, people would have been very affected. I know I was personally very affected by seeing scenes in hospitals, say in Italy, where doctors were having to make decisions about who could go on a respirator. I mean, that, that really hit home to me. I was like, I don't want to be that person in that position. That's, we don't want that here. We've got to do something about this. For decades, we didn't have enough action on climate change or other environmental problems. There started to be real uh, public concern during the fires because we couldn't breathe more so than the fires themselves or the heat. Um, and then through the pandemic, there was it stopped the world in ways that environmental issues never have because people were fearing for their health. So I guess my question to, to everyone is, is uh, issues such as climate change and other environmental problems, do they need to be framed more around threats to our health rather than our threats to environment? Um, these are health issues as well as environmental issues, but are we forgetting about talking about things like climate change uh, as a threat to our health? I think, I think one of the sad things about that question, actually, is that it makes me think, how sick does the planet have to get before we realise that we are getting sick too? Like, what's the tipping point? That's, that disturbs me because I think it's going to be quite sick before it really happens. Yeah. I remember being... <laughs> I'm not sure that the right emotion, a little frustrated perhaps, because the bushfires was such a clear example of how we're getting it wrong. Um, it, it really was. And I thought, 
while it's absolutely hideous, a billion animals dying, that's got to be a trigger that opens a discussion. And just as we stepped into the room to have that discussion, a human virus struck and we all walked away from having this discussion. And so my question is, when do we bring it back? The virus is just part of the same pandemic of us polluting the space we live in. But we, we still haven't had that discussion about how our behaviors caused those fires. It was a human caused event, it was avoidable. Thanks so much, that was amazing. Satellite images like the one I'm showing here, I think are really etched into our, our minds from the extraordinary bushfire season that we had in Australia in 2019 and 2020. And we saw this national tragedy kind of unfurling before our eyes in the media. Um, we saw the, the billions of animals dying, the human lives lost, human livelihoods lost, and then this groundswell of support and empathy from, from both Australians and, and around the world. And we've heard recently in the, the Bushfire Royal Commission the impact that, that this bushfire season had to both the lives, um, but also the air quality that impacted our health, the impact on our Indigenous lands and their culture and the terrifying number of animal losses and the, the environments that will be forever changed. So as a meteorologist and a, and a climate scientist, this image also speaks to me about the interconnectedness of our world and that we don't need to live where the bushfires are blazing to have an impact because the winds uh, are bringing that smoke um, to far reaching places. And you can see it's not just in the cities and the country towns in Australia and the rivers and the mountains and the farms that across the Southern Ocean that this smoke ended up reaching. And I think this image also helps me reflect on the response of the firefighters and the volunteers that work together to um, fight the fires in, in the midst of adversity and gave us a glimpse into the future where we expect these bushfires to be more frequent um, and more hot weather associated with climate change. And then along came COVID and provided us with another global challenge. And in many ways, it's similar to climate change. It's both invisible and it's global. We can't necessarily see the CO2 that's building up in the atmosphere, just as we can't see the virus with the naked eye. Um, but we know from the science and from the data and from the impacts that, that climate change is real, just as the virus is real and that the greenhouse gas, em gas emissions, even if we emit them here, they quickly get tr transported around the world, just as the people um, transported the virus around the world through air travel. So in the pandemic, we've heard a lot about curves and flattening the curves. And this is a curve that climate scientists um, really worry about and want to flatten. And this is the CO2 concentrations taken from ice cores um, on the left over 800,000 years before today. And then from our station in Northwest Tasmania, Cape Grim, that's been measuring CO2 concentrations in the, the last 70, uh, 50 years or so. And you can just see the concern really as climate scientists is the, the steepness of this curve. And that was a, a concern in the pandemic that it's just rapidly getting out of control. The problem with that steepness is that our systems can't cope. Our ecosystems can't adapt fast enough to this change in the CO2 concentrations. So back at the start of the pandemic, we were told we need to enact measures such as social distancing and closing our borders, otherwise the consequences would be dire. And how did we work that out? Well, Michael J. Fox um, in Back to the Future was able to have a DeLorean, a, a machine that could take him back and forward in time and he could fix things that he might have messed up. But we don't have a DeLorean, but we do have models. And these models here, I'm showing a climate model, um, one of the most recent climate models that is able to simulate virtual worlds. And if you look at that image, you might mistake it for a real satellite image. It can simulate clouds and we can use these models to project forward into the pathways that we might want for our world. And what do these models show? Well, this is a postcard which includes some of those models' projections for the future. In the black line, we have the Australian temperatures over the last 100 or so years. And you can see 2019 is the last data point, the hottest and driest year that Australia has experienced in this instrumental record. And in the top curve, the pink lines are showing the Australian temperatures from the models where we include emissions in a business as usual scenario where we keep burning fossil fuels and 
using the same energy mix as we have. In the bottom panel, the green lines are showing a very low emission scenario where we change our energy mix, where we stop burning fossil fuels and we keep our temperatures to the values that we can manage. And so I'll just end with images of the world that we wish to be in, ones where the coral reefs are still vibrant, where the ice sheets are still intact, and where my son can go for a walk in the Dandenongs and have a good time. Thank you. Has a lot of data come in over the last couple of months that are showing the world improving just a little bit as far as CO2 emissions? Uh, is it too soon to tell what impact this has had? Yeah, that's a really good question. There is data in real time that we can see the CO2 concentrations and the emissions. And the data is showing that we'll probably have about a 7% decrease in CO2 emissions this year. But in order to flatten the curve to get to that green line, we need that every year. And we don't want to have to do it in the way that we've done. We don't want to have these lives lost. We don't want to have lockdown. We need to um, act early. And I think the pandemic has shown us that we can if we act early and we um, make these choices, that we, we can do it in a, a, a more systematic way. So I noticed your low emissions scenario was still two degrees, um, which is um, significant, actually. Um, how, how aggressive do we have to be to, um, to get to that level? We need, as I said, that sustained um, reduction, so 7% reduction every year for, for so decades. So it's about 7%, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's going to be really tough to get there, but I think the pandemic has shown us that we can band together and we can use evidence-based um, science to make decisions and to make decisions that help all of society come together. I suppose, Julie, um, and you said this in, in your talk, that one of the things for me as a scientist that I suppose gave me hope during COVID was that they were listening to the science. And as you said, it was this it was this COVID was this thing that was going to happen in the future and it was, well, if we do this, it won't be as bad. It's not going to, there's, there's still, yeah, it's still been lives lost. There's still been livelihoods lost, but it wasn't as bad as what it could have been. So people came together and for their communities, for their, for their loved ones to, to take these actions. And so I was, I suppose, really... I'm an optimist too, and I, I, I never thought actually that that low emission scenario was was possible. But you know, perhaps if if we're all taking action and we take some of these lessons, do you feel it could be? Yeah, I think there's definitely a lot of similarities here with, um, and and it does encourage me that that we can act if the if the the threat is urgent and looks um, that it might impact ourselves. And with climate change, it doesn't feel that urgent, but in fact it is. Every um, time we keep burning, uh, putting more CO2 into the atmosphere, it's um, leading to you know, a, a larger impact. And so the urgency is really being brought home by the bushfires, and I, I, I'm encouraged through the pandemic that we can have the, act, the will to act. Yeah. I'm wondering, is it... As individuals and COVID, we were told, you know, to wear masks, to distance, to sanitise our hands. We, we were sort of given an action sheet. And I know that the scientific community have very given a very well detailed action sheet of what we should do. But is it personalising it so as every household has to do X, Y and Z, but businesses as well have to do a certain thing. Um, I, I know we've spoken of carbon prices before, but what is it that gives it that personal picture that will make people act? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think, again, the bushfires really did make us feel like it was hitting us personally in Australia. Um, and I think community action is, is definitely required, but it's really at that government level that we need to, to act and, and the pandemic showed that the governments can listen and use evidence um, to make decisions quickly and I'm hopeful that through this that um, governments around the world will, will 
listen and put in place the mechanisms so that the scientific information and you know information from other all of the information can be used to make decisions i'm not saying science is the only thing that needs to be considered but it, it decisions need to be made with evidence and we can as scientists say what will work and what won't work and give them options thank you so much that was amazing